Well, thank you everybody for joining me for another exciting webinar from the Cinemeric family. Uh, today we're going to talk about DXF part programming, but specifically our new functionality of DXF part programming for software version 4.7. So uh, this is uh, a new feature function to us. We've allowed the ability of programming from a DXF file for quite a long time, but it did require a separate piece of software. So if anybody had seen my previous webinar on a similar topic that was using an external piece of software to be able to open up the DXF file, then you had to create a file that you would then bring over to the machine. We now, come version 4.7, have the ability of bringing the DXF files right to the machine tool so you don't have that extra step. Um, and then we can drive from there. So that's what we're going to dig into a bit today. I am your presenter here, Chris Pollack. I am a uh, product specialist for Siemens, um, specifically concentrating on the operation and programming side of the content for the Cinemaric product line. I certainly do get into a fair amount of service-based questions or commissioning questions, but my specialty as a whole is more from the operation and programming perspective. But if you guys ever need any help, feel free to certainly reach out to me. My contact information is here on the screen, and you'll see it again at the end of this uh, seminar as well when we do the Q&A section. So if you miss it now, don't worry. You can write it down later. I'd say probably the best way to get a hold of me certainly would be email. I do travel a fair amount, so it's always easiest to uh, respond back to you guys via email. But if you're in a bind, feel free to reach out to me on the phone as well. So just to give you a little teaser what's coming up, and I had it on the splash screen before, um, our next webinar in October is going to be getting into some advanced turning. So we're going to start talking about working with machines with subspindles and how do I take apart, transfer it from one to the other, and all the types of features and functions used in that kind of advanced technology. And then from there, we've got a, a bunch of new webinars coming up in the new year. Um, we're going to start setting up the, uh, the order of them uh, shortly. So uh, from the webinars, anybody that's on here or seeing this that's maybe not familiar with our material, uh, you can drill directly to our cnc for You website, or you can use the direct URL right at the top that dri drives you right to our CNC webinar page. Um, but we host a webinar every six weeks or so, and then all of the webinars, the recordings that we do here, will get categorized and are there for viewing right off our CNC View page. So there's a ton of stuff there. I think to date, we're sitting at 25 webinars, and that library is only growing. So um, by all means, check it out. It's a great resource. Additionally, we offer in-person training on said topics at our training facility in Chicago, Illinois, right outside, uh, very close to the O'Hare Airport. So if anybody is interested in getting to interact with the product even a little more closely, you want to come out and attend one of our in-person classes, they are free of charge. You can drive over to the CNC training section of CNC for You, and there you can see the agendas. We host four classes, a service-based class, and then three different levels of operation and programming, starting with conversational programming, moving into G-code and more advanced technology, and then right up to our level three class, which is a full five access class that I personally host myself. So if you um, would like to come out, we'd be more than welcome to, uh, more than happy to have you attend some of these classes. So check it out. Hopefully you can take advantage of it. And if you want to register for the class, just click on the registration link, propagate the page, and it'll put you in our system. So today's content, uh, we do have a couple different variations of our control. There's three, as a matter of fact. Everything we're doing today is specific to the 828 and the 840 control. Um, so anything we talk about will work in either control platform. So as a, as a whole, today's concept is really just to introduce you to the new DXF converter for version 4.7, and then take a look at how it functions, what are some of its key features, and then through a real, real live example, we're going to show you how to apply it and use it. So at the end of this uh, webinar, you should be pretty comfortable in being able to actually utilize this functionality. So probably the first thing people 
always ask me, especially those of us that maybe uh, aren't that versed in the CAD side of the world, is, you know, what is a DXF file? What, what does this really mean to me as a machinist or as a uh, small shop owner? Um, so a DXF file is really just a, a universal file format. It was originally created by AutoCAD or Autodesk um, as just a simple way to have a basic file that can be exported and brought to other formats. And it's been pretty much adopted by the industry as a whole as a standard format or protocol to be able to share um, CAD information. So with that said, since it is pretty much the most universal format, it is the method or the format that we utilize for our converter. So what is it really going to do for me? Well, no matter how the part was modeled, whether it was a simple two-dimensional part or something more complex in 3D solid modeling like you see here, it allows me to take a specific projected view and create a line drawing from that model. And that's what the DXF is going to look like. And that's what the DXF is going to look like as we bring it into the control. So typically here, to get the DXF, you're either going to have to be handed it directly or you have to go into to another piece of software, whether it be, you know, any kind of drawing package, um, our software from the NX side of the world, um, AutoCAD, SolidWorks, any one of those, um, or bringing in a, a part file into maybe your CAM system, and then you'll have the ability to be able to pick a set view and then build the DXF file off of that. Now, what are some of the limitations? To working in the DXF format, specifically as it works with our CAD readers. Um, this is a 2D file format structure, um, so we don't or can't support any three-dimensional images in this, so this would all be two-dimensional based. And you've really got to be very careful with how clean the file formats are as well. Um, you know, it's, it's easy for somebody to be drawing in a, in a in a projective view or, or a top view, thinking things connect, not realizing that as I tipped it out and I looked at it three-dimensionally, I got all things at, at different planes and different levels. When you go to build the DXF file from this type of file format, it's not going to be a clean file. So when you look at the DXF, and we'll talk about that more as we move on, you got to make sure that this file is as clean as possible. Lines connect with other lines. Um, there's not big gaps, you know, something as simple as having a 5,000 gap between two points, from the controls perspective, that's two different entities. So we do have to make sure that these files aren't just viewable, but the, the content is clean for being able to use them. But what's the real benefit here? Well, certainly complexity of contour shapes. So, you know, when you get to more complex shapes that I want to be able to machine and work with, last thing I want to have to do is do all that data entry at the control. I mean, you can certainly do it. You can go into our contour editor and start plugging in all those points and finding the tangencies of elements and whatnot. But if we can think about how much time that's going to take and then potentially how much error could be caused by people just having to plug in the numbers, so there's too much chance for, for error. So here we can bring in these complex shapes and through a quick, easy method, we can start to pick the entities we need and then bring them into the control so we can immediately lay a tool path to it. And that's what you're going to get to see a little bit here. So how does it actually work? Well, again, it's a utility that's going to be now found on the specific control. So I'm going to bring the file into the control. I can certainly get it in there in a number of different formats. Probably the most common would be just sticking on a USB device, but it can be on a network, it can be transferred in, um, multiple ways to get the file in. But once the DXF's in there, then we'll be able to start using it right onto the control. So from a very high level, what is it going to do for us at the control? It's really going to kind of hit a bunch of key areas. Um, you can just use it to be able to open up drawings. Um, once the drawings open, you can go in and check dimensional data, find locations. So even if you're not going to use it to physically program a part, there's a lot of tools there that we'll explore that allow me to go in and, and integrate the part. But in addition, I can start to generate contours and shapes from the DXF and then use them directly directly in my part programming strategy. And that would go in place of the, uh, the contour that I normally would draw by hand. So the first area or functionality we are going to look at is the ability of viewing DXF files. 
Now this does not require any kind of option. So as long as your machine has 4.7 software, you will be able to open up DXF files and they will be a supported format at the control. Now, you're not gonna be able to do a whole lot with them um, as far as if you wanna to start to create the part program, it is an option required. And we're gonna talk about that, you're gonna see that. But what you can do here is you can still get into the file, you can measure different features, you can check dimensional data, um, maybe you have notes or setup sheet information, whatnot embedded into the drawing. So you still have quite a bit of functionality even without having the option. However, if you get the option, you can then start to use these drawing files inside of your part program. And the way it's gonna work is when I'm writing a program, if I go to create a contour like I normally would for path milling or pocket milling, you're gonna see a new button here. And the new button is gonna say import from DXF file. And that file or that button is gonna let me browse to that DXF file we were just looking at. It's gonna open up a little editor for me and then I can start to go in and do a bunch of things to the file. I can certainly just um, start to pick different elements of the file and see what the dimensional data is on it. I can start to manage different layers inside of a program. So it's very common for drawing files to contain what we call layers. And that's um, really that's used by, by drafters to be able to turn pieces of the drawing on and off, kind of like if I was drawing on, on multiple layers of pieces of paper that were all translucent to each other. So when they're all on top of each other, I see the whole drawing, but I could take one of those sections out and maybe the dimension lines go away. So here you can go in, you can see the layers that were embedded in the DX file and we can start to turn them on and off as we need to. We'll be able to then go in, we can clean up the drawing, not only by um, taking some layers out we can actually delete entities. Um, what is kind of nice is if you do a lot of work, you clean up your drawing, which you're gonna get a chance to see, and I wanna save it, so later I can go back and I don't have to go through all those steps again. You can actually write the DXF file or save the DXF file once you have the option. And this will then allow it to come into the same state that you left it previously. Once you do that, you can start to pick entities, pick the contour points you want, and then what's gonna happen here is it's gonna then output whatever geometry you happen to pick, and it's going to transition over into the part program. Now we support this DXF converter in both methods of programming within our control. So shop mill or shop turn, which is our conversational interface. And as well, you can do this in G-code or what we call program guide. So that would be program guide in a mill or lay that's relevant. So once you get the option, it's supported in both programming environments. Now, the look and feel might be a little different. Obviously, there's some difference between shop mill and program guide or shop turn and program guide. So we're gonna show you some of those little differences. But basically, if, if you're a user that's already using our controls, you already know how to create contours in either or both of those methods, that side's gonna look all the same. It's just a, really a matter of just how do I give it the, the information in the contour editor is where the DXF converter kind of comes in. Okay, so so again, just some of the things to really watch out for. Um, one of the things is if the, the DXF file isn't clean, um, if you know if things aren't laid laid out logically, then the converter might not understand. So let's say for argument's sake, you know half of a contour was on one layer, the other half was on another layer. Well, then all of a sudden these entities really don't connect. So they look like they do because they're on top of each other and when they're all turned on, it makes a shape. But if I turn different layers on and off, now all of a sudden I only have pieces of the contour. The system's not gonna know how to handle that because when I go to pick it, it's gonna think it's a separate entity. So the cleaner the drawing file is, the better you'll be able to take advantage of this type of functionality. Um, additionally, the software doesn't, we don't necessarily know whether you have a mouse or a touch screen on your control. Now you'll see, and I'll show you, you don't actually have to have a mouse or a touch screen at the machine tool. You can actually use this driven off of some of the buttons, but depending on how complex the drawing file gets, it may be a little cumbersome that way. Um, so depending on your machine hardware, if you're doing a lot of converting of the DXF converter at the control, and you know you have a lot of detail to your drawings, uh, may be helpful to say plug in a mouse 
to the machine tool. That's certainly an option you can do, um, or possibly even do this offline. So what you're going to see is we're going to do this through CindyTrain. So CindyTrain could be a solution, um, and then still allows you to do the part programming you would do at the machine tool. So it doesn't have to be done with the control, but it's still done natively inside of the Cinemark control, whether it's in CindyTrain or physically at the machine. So we're going to go through three programming examples. The first one, we're going to start out with the basics. So here, I got a simple job we're going to do. We're going to machine some bottle openers. And for me, I want to be able to grab the um, lower left hand projected view. So I want to grab the top view. And that top view, I want to grab the contour around it. So that's the part shape I have to machine. So I just want to do a simple path mill around the shape, but I don't want to have to put in all these data inputs. So what you're going to see is we're going to go in, we're going to start to create a part program or get to the programming environment. When we're there, we'll look at how do I just view the DXF file. And again, this is that functionality that does not require any options. So we can come in, we can open it, we can look at a few different things. I'll show you what's capable there. Then when we're ready to, we're going to jump into creating a program. This first two examples we're going to do through ShopMill. Um, so we're going to do a basic example and then a little more advanced. And then I'm also going to show you how it would work in the G-code side. So you'll get a good overall view of the process in general. So we'll go in, we'll create a part program. Part program in ShopMill is going to look the same as I normally would. So there's nothing new here. If you guys are familiar with creating part programs in our control, you're going to do the same steps up until the point when you want to actually create the contour. So when I'm going to go and create a milling tool path. So I'm going to do contour milling, and I go to create new contour. Now I'm going to use that new button I see. So if you're curious if your control has the option, well, if you don't see the import from DXF file button, then certainly you're going to have to add the option to the control as long as you're running 4.7. Um, if you do see it, it's going to work exactly the same way as you're seeing here. What's nice about this functionality, it doesn't require any kind of commissioning from the OEM's perspective. So if you happen to get the machine without it and you want to add it, it's really a matter of just getting the license and turning it on. Um, shouldn't be any additional functionality or setup need to be done at the control. Turn it on and you'll have the, the feature. So we'll drive over to the DXF file. We'll open up the file. Then we're going to go through some steps to clean it up. I'm going to show you how you can change the drawing around a little bit. We're going to then pick our entities, create a contour. We'll move our part zero around, because that's important. A lot of times when the DXF files come in, you know, the part zero may be in some complete random location. So we're going to pick some of these entities and then accept it, push it over into our contour editor, and then we'll be able to then associate it with a milling strategy like you would do any contour that you had created at the control. So we'll do a live demonstration of these functions that you've kind of been given a high-level overview on. And we're going to use that inside CineTrain. So the process you're seeing here, this would be the same as to whether I was doing it at the machine's control or we're doing it through our PC emulator we call CineTrain. So first step, obviously I'd have to have the file in the machine or I'd have to get it there. So all of my file management's done in my program manager. So I'm going to want to go over to program manager. In my case, I have a couple DXF files sitting down in a folder under my workpiece directory. Now, the file itself, there are some limitations to where files can be on the control. So part program is only supporting MPF files. So had I tried to maybe copy my file and put it in MPF, let me go up there. Oh, we opened that up. So now we're allowing you to put the DXF files into the part program. So I'm glad I tried that. <laughs> Always love doing this stuff live. Um, traditionally, prior to 4.7, uh, we only allowed MPF files to be in the part program folder. So it looks like we're relaxing that rule a little bit. Um, for my case, I'm just working down in a workpiece directory. So I would copy and paste this file in like I would do any other file. So whether it be from the USB, an external drive. Once it's in, I now have the ability of opening up the file through the viewing function. And again, this is a standard feature in 4.7. So highlight your file, hit the blue arrow to the right as if I was going to edit a part program, she's going to launch the viewer. So this is going to show us what it's seeing from the DXF conversion portion of the file. So in here, 
we can start to look at a few different things. So I can clear and think of the clear function as whenever I want to change kind of what I'm displaying, I'm going to go into clear. If I want to learn more about the feature or I want to just move things around, I'm going to go to details. So what I mean by that is if I go to clear, I see the layer selection. So this is how I can start turning things on and off. So in this case, there's a couple different layers. There's a title block, there's a base layer called zero and dimensions. So I may not know where my lines are on, so I can just start to turn these layers on and off. I get to a point where I don't see anything, that's because I turned all my layers off. So I can see that the geometry is on layer zero, and then my title block is on the title block layer, and certainly my dimensions are on my dimension layer. So I can get rid of some stuff, clean it up. Here we can back up. I can go into the details option, and here I can zoom in. I can do a magnifying glass if I want to zoom around something. So if I want to look at the top view or the 3D view, I can zoom right into it. So let's say I wanted to know the size of that hole, because we're going to have to drill the hole. Well, we have this feature called geometry info. So geometry info allows me to select element info, and whatever I click on, whatever I'm highlighted, it's going to give me the information on that specific element. So in this case, I know this hole is a 935 radius by the location of the hole, but this location is relative to some random zero point. So for me to know this position based on a part zero location, you would need to start to shift the zero. And that's a different function we're going to show you how to do when we start to create our program. And then I can start to move my image around a little bit, around in space, we can rotate things up or down. From the view perspective, probably not as handy. Uh, this is great if I wanted to, you know, work on a feature, but I know I need it oriented differently than it was drawn. Then I can flip things around and get from that orientation. So again, this, this is all drawn. the functionality we're starting to see just from the viewer portion. No, we want to go and actually can flip things around and derive the geometry from that orientation. So again, this is all the functionality we're going to start to see just from the we want to go me to say, okay, which drawing file do you want to open? So here I had open, that's my source, DXL. So highlight the example one, select OK, and it's going to open up your drawing file. So I got a couple of things I want to do here. I want to start picking the entity, but if I start to zoom into this, I'm going to see that, you know, with all these dimension lines all over the place, it's going to be kind of tricky to pick these, these components. 
So what we can do is we can start to clean up the drawing a little bit. So first and foremost, I can go to my clear option. In clear, I'm probably going to want to shut some layers off. So just like we saw below, before, I can start to toggle some layers off. Now there's an option called select area. And what select area allows me to do is I can move a box around and it's going to grab everything that's inside the box. The rest of the stuff basically gets deleted. So now next time I come in, it's only going to show me what's here. So I create the box. I say, OK, now I get this image. So if you were to now zoom back out, say with details, you can see there's nothing else there. And when I hit auto zoom, it's going to go right to that feature. So I just really got rid of the other views that I don't need. Additionally, well, my zero is probably in the wrong spot, right? So I need to back out of the clear area, because that's where I was just before. So I'm just going to hit the back key. And I want to go to specify reference point. And the reference point is referring to the zero on the part. So in this case, somebody had pre-drawn a couple hidden lines here for me to stipulate where the part zero would be held from. And this is a common thing that probably wouldn't have been there from the original DXF file when it was first built. So if, you ha if you're using DXF and you have a way to open them up externally and maybe add a couple little pieces of information that you know you're going to need, it just makes things a little quicker and easier for you when you get it out to the control. Um, but here, I'm just going to pick how I'm picking the element. So let's say I wanted the middle of this hole. I could say circle center. I could set a zero in the center of any arc. right? Or I can pick start or end point of element, and that'll just change where my bullseye is. But this is going to represent my part zero. So once I say OK, you see how the zero of my scale lines up with this corner. So now as I pick this geometry, it's all going to be relative to that zero point. Some of the other things I can do is I can also delete elements. So when I go to chain this, I have a couple lines that are going to be touching that have nothing to do with my contour. So they might, they might give you a little bit of a hard time sometimes. I might have to manually start to pick things. So if I don't need them anymore, I can just do a quick element delete, highlight the element and say OK. And now I can get rid of some unnecessary geometry too. So, so you want to get it as clean as you can. Now in this case, I did a fair amount of work to get the drawing file to the way I want it and the way I'm going to use it moving forward. So I have the ability of doing a save DXF. Now, when you do save DXF, it's going to immediately want to overwrite the source file. You might not want to do that. You know, I may want to get back. Maybe I deleted something I didn't realize I still needed. So do yourself a favor, change the name slightly, and then say OK. It'll ask where you want to save it to. So I'm going to save it right to the webinar folder. Say OK. Now, when I go back, you're going to see that I have a new DXF file, a second one created, and it's just set up the way this part was. So if I jump back out, I'm going to cancel out of here. And to show you, we now have a new DXF file, which is what I've modified up. So the cleaning of it is uh, very, very handy. So now I can keep just drilling right into it. and I don't have to worry about clearing all that stuff out of the way every time I go into this drawing file. OK, so we're going to keep on working on our sample one. Here, since I canceled it, I just got to create the profile again. Now you're going to get a chance to see how to pick this geometry. OK. So I come in, I can now pick my new DXF file, brings the one I was just working on. I certainly, I could have stayed in it the whole time before I didn't have to leave it. But now I'm going to start to select what we call elements. So a feature, a geometry is what we refer to as an element. So you see I have the select element button immediately when you come in. So you want to hit select element. And prior to that, you may want to know how it's going to respond when you start to pick the select element. So underneath this expansion key for vertical soft keys, there's some options here. So this is going to tell me what's going to happen once I start chaining this feature. So if I have it on automatic, the minute I click the entity, it's going to try to chain the whole thing in one shot or whatever it's tangent. Or I can leave it blank or I can do it to a one step by step. The zoom element's kind of handy. If I'm doing a piece by piece, but I got a lot of detail, 
it'll change the window and it'll zoom to a specific spot. So sometimes it's nice to see what this was left in. Now the other thing that's very important is you want to check to see what your under details, right? Go to details, what your snap radius is. And this goes back to a default value of 0.1. Now don't let this fool you. It's saying 0.1 in millimeters. Unfortunately, we're not changing this label. So this is just a label that was kind of left left there from whether the, had the machine been in metric, but this machine's not in metric, this is an inch right now. So this is actually an inch value that's being interpreted. So as I start to click things, what it's gonna do is it's gonna try to grab things that are within a hundred thou distance of each other. Problem is that's a pretty coarse scale. So it could then get confused as to what elements it needs to pick. So normally I would set this in metric, that would be fine. Uh, in inch, normally I'd set this to five or 10 thou. Um, once you make this change here, it's going to save with this file, but when you go to do another one, you want to check your snap radius because it, it will flip back to the default of 0.1. So set your snap radius. Now we can start to pick some elements. So hit the select element key, so I just backed out. And now you're going to start to see I can start to pick different features. So let's say I'm looking at this top line, and I click the top line. Now you see how the blue dot is on the right side of the screen, and then the orange is pointing to the left. This is important, because this is going to be not only the way it chains, but the way it outputs to the contour editor. And in the end of the day, whatever the direction is, that would be the default direction it would try to mill in. So I do want to think about, if I'm on a climb mill or conventional mill, if I'm OD or ID, think about this direction. So to move where this little dot is, I use these buttons that immediately came up. So do I want the, we're determining the start of the line is, or the end of the line, or maybe the center of the line. So I want to put the end of the line in this case, because I want to walk around this thing clockwise. So when I machine it, I'm climb milling it. Once you have that set up, just say okay. And now she's automatically going to start chaining for you. Now, since I haven't picked any other strategy, it's going to chain one feature at a time. Had I, under this expansion button, had zoom selected, now you see it goes and starts to zoom each area, and I'm going to unzoom this real quick, right, so I keep on moving around. So that's handy if there's a lot of detail, and I want to, I want to make sure I'm grabbing the exact entities I want. But let's say I know it's a pretty clean drawing. Well, here, I can just leave this at automatic, and now when I click, you see everything gets chained in one shot. So usually when I'm grabbing stuff and I know they're pretty clean drawings, I just leave it on automatic, click, and away it goes. If I get a lot of features that have tangency to other features, lines that are coming in from other areas, and I think that it might catch the wrong thing, then I might just click, click through. So that's, you know, that strategy is going to change from part to part. But at the end of the day, once you've gotten what you want, you're going to hit the accept contour key. Now, I didn't have to go all the way to the end, so my shapes don't have to fully chain all the way around, just like my standard contour with a path milling cycle does not have to complete to the end. But in this case, I certainly would want to machine the entire shape. Hit your accept contour. It's going to ask if you want to complete the chamfer or transfer. I say yes, and it dumps all that data now into my contour editor. Now, it's nice here is I can actually start to go in and not only see all the output data, but, but you know if there was a radius I needed to tweak, maybe I was getting a little mismatch and I wanted to try to increase or decrease the radius side, kind of blend that out, you can now modify, fully modify this. You're not locked into the way it was drawn. That's just giving you the start of it, which is pretty powerful because a lot of DXF converters that I've seen on other, uh, on other comparable systems, you know, you're Whatever's in that drawing, that's what you got, and you can't make any changes to it. So we can change it here. We can actually make changes inside of the drawing, too. There's a, an extra piece of the tool that allows us to modify the elements if we needed to. So just check it over, make sure it's all good. Hit Accept. It saves it as a contour, as if I had just manually typed it out. So anybody that would just look at this part of the program, if they didn't know that you did it from a decept, they'd have no way of knowing. Now I can associate it to a path milling cycle. 
Here you would just fill out like you normally would, your traditional speeds and feeds, depth of cut, how I maybe want to lead in or lead out. Accept it, the two associate, just as if you were going to do a standard path mill. We can start to simulate it. And now we can see that we're machining around our part. You see it did the lead in and lead out, right, where I picked my start. I can see it in 3D here. My uh, strategy, obviously, was two depths of cut. In this case, this might not be an optimal initial strategy because we got some leftover material here, but it's certainly a start, and then we can kind of decide how we want to move from there. But again, taking something that had quite a bit of detail to it, and quickly and easily by picking a few points, we can now start to make some pretty complex path milling functions. Okay, so that's certainly the start of this, this uh, tool, shall I say. From here, what we want to now do is explore maybe a little more advanced functionality. So one of the next things we want to take a look at is, well, what if we want to do like maybe islands, islands with, with um, uh, or pockets, shall I say, and pockets with maybe islands nested in it, or maybe it was a boss milling cycle, so I wanted to machine up and leave a spigot standing. So you can start to do all that functionality with the CAD reader. So any of the advanced functions you're used to doing within the control, the CAD reader, the DXF reader, will actually support. In addition, I can start to do some holes. I can start to put different hole locations around the parts. We're going to, have to show you how to not only support milling type of features, but we're also going to look at drilling. So in here, we're going to go and we're going to create a couple contours from a slightly different drawing. We're going to create an irregular pocket shape, and then we're going to go and we're going to create a, um, a spigot or a boss mill or feature that we're going to use as an island, um, and then we're going to associate them. So the process as how I will build this and chain this would be the same as if I was doing it normally. So if you're used to doing pockets and pockets with islands or pockets or, or spigots, you know, where we're leaving something standing or machining from one area to another, you always work from the outside in. So I would draw the first contour. I would represent my pocket in this case. I would then draw the next contact contour that would represent my island. And they would chain in such a fashion, just like you see at the bottom of the screen. And then I associate the cycle to it. So from the DXF converter side of the world, it's going to work the exact same way. I'm going to go in, I'm going to create my first contour, but I'm going to pick the DXF and use the DXF to create it. Then I'll go and create the second contour, pick the DXF, and then we'll assign our routines to it, how we want to physically mill it. Now, in addition, we're then going to start to look at some different strategies of holes. You know, if I'm if I got a lot of holes on a part and I don't want to sit there and have to put in all that data, that data input, well, I can do that through the DXF file function. Now, what's neat is now you get a new button inside of the position screen. So now I can just jump over to the DXF file, grab the locations I want. It supports either random holes, or grids of holes, or bolt hole patterns. So if you know you have specific features and you don't want to pick them as random locations, like a bolt hole pattern, you're going to see we're going to be able to shove the data in just as a bolt hole, as long as there's a common radius. Certainly, if it's not really a true bolt hole pattern, like uh, an ellipse or something, then I would just pick them as random holes. But you'll see we're going to set up a drilling cycle, pick a couple different hole locations, and then build the part program from there. So transitioning back into Sinu Train, we're now going to create our new sample. It's going to be sample two. So we're going to do a new program. Again, shop mill for now. I'm going to show you G code in a minute. And we'll type in sample two, select OK. We're in writing the program. So I want to give it some basic blank stuff for my graphics. So I happen to know that the the part is basically four by four. I certainly could go into the drawing file and, and measure the feature. But I'm going to say accept. So the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to go in. Now, I haven't opened up the drawing file yet. I'm going to wait till we, we get into creating the contours. But I know I wanted to machine the pocket first. So we're going to go and we're going to grab that pocket, and then we're going to add the island. So go to Contour Mill. Go to New Contour, just like we did give it a name. So I'm going to call mine Pocket. The name has no bearing on the program, 
or the operation. It's just for your reference. I could call it number one and number two. Pick the import for DXF. Make sure that's still highlighted. Select accept. Now I'm going to want to go grab example2.dxf. Say OK. Now, in this case, I don't have all kinds of crazy dimension lines and whatnot. It's got a basic part. We got some three peripheral holes I want to drill, a little bolt hole pattern. But I do have this title block, and I do have some zero in space. So I can do the same thing you just saw. I can clean up the drawing. So first things first, I'm going to go to clear. Now I'm going to go to layer. Now in this case, everything was drawn on a common layer. So picking the layer option is not going to help me. If I show up the layer, I lose everything. So now I can just use the select area, and that's going to let me just grab what I want to grab and get rid of all the other stuff outside of it. Okay, since I only want to now put, adjust my reference point, I'm going to back out of this screen. We'll go to the specify reference point, and now I can click on where I want it. So we're going to go click right there, and there is my zero location. You see the little bullseye, and I can certainly put this anywhere. We can also move the element around, right? Oh, no. Okay. So I need to, once I've picked my reference point, uh, I want to cancel out of that. No, actually, let me do this one more time. I get out of the sequence. Okay, so we're doing our pocket. Sorry. I'll use the two. Let me just clear. I forgot to save it. I wanted to make sure I saved it. So let's select the area, just like you saw. Oops, zoom out a little bit. We're going to specify the reference point. So I'm going to click on where I want my reference point. There's my zero. I'm going to go back to clear, and let's just save the DXF. So this way, if I need to get back to it, I'll have a clean DXF file. So I'm going to call it sample 2A. Yep, save it. Okay, uh, oops, I want to do that again, but I want a different directory. Uh, all right, I want to put it here. Uh, nope. Now I forgot to make my modification. Sorry, guys. Okay, so I'll create a new one. Nice as it warns me that I was about to overwrite it, which is handy. Okay, so we got our zero, we got our clean drawing. Let's go pick our features. So now watch what happens here. When I click on specify reference point, it's going to just pick some random line. Now this may or may not be the entity that I want. So I can keep hitting the select element option and move it anywhere I want in the drawing. So this is what I was saying before. You don't need a mouse or a touch screen to actually use this function. But you will have to kind of click all the way around to find which element you would want to start from. Certainly it's a lot easier to bring your mouse over, but if you don't have it, that's okay. You can still use this function. So for us, I'm going to pick some line or entity. Now, I do want to pay attention to the direction. Now, keep in mind, this is a pocket. So I would want to go the other direction. So I'm climb milling when I go around the wall of this part. Say OK. And now, since I had auto selected from before, it maintained that. So it automatically changed the whole changed the whole thing. Now let's say I got more than I wanted. You have a revert button. And revert just backs you up. So here if I was accepting things, all right, let's back it up. You can see how I can undo all the way back to my first one. Maybe I didn't want automatic on. I could back it up a little bit and then start accepting the same thing. The accept element would do the same thing. So again, you don't need to have a mouse. You can click through. In this case, I want to get all the way to my last element. Make sure everything is blue. Once you're there, hit accept contour. Transfers it over. Now I have this shape into my contour editor. And just like you saw before, I would have all the geometry relative to a zero point that I picked. 
Now, in this case, there's some dependency. I needed to create the pocket and then associate the island with it. So I'm going to go back to New Contour, and I'm going to build my island. And at this point, I want to make sure I pick my 2A, because that's my cleaned up one. That's why I wanted to make sure that I had saved that, so I didn't, didn't have to move everything. The other thing that's nice with saving it is the last thing you want to do is maybe you had shifted your zero, you didn't save it, and then all of a sudden you jump back in, forget to shift your zero again. Now you're picking features that are relative to another zero, and that can certainly mess you up. So it's, it's good to you know get everything situated the way you want it, then make that save. Okay, select my element. I can bring my mouse over in this case. Since I know that this is going to be a boss or an island, I may want to choose a different direction. So this way, if I want to do a finish cut around the part, it will climb though, so that's something to think about. But from here, start to accept the elements until you get all the way around. Accept the contour. Now we have this next feature. So at this point, it's a matter of really just associating it with whatever milling strategy I want to use. In our case, we're going to use a pocketing cycle. Pick a tool. Here I pre-selected the 3 ace tool. I gave it some simple speeds and feeds. You guys should know how to do this kind of stuff. I hit accept. Once I've accepted it, I go to simulate. All right. There we go. Pocket comes around. We see our machine feature. And then I can add finish cuts and do all the, the kind of crazy stuff I would normally do. Okay. So we got in our pocketing. We do need to add in our drilling routine. So now I'm going to go to drill. I'm just going to pick a simple can cycle strategy. Here I have a 3 16th drill. It's going to go 5 eighths deep preset. So I'm going to chain my drilling cycles. Now when I go to positions, I choose the strategy. So if I'm going to do a bolt pattern, I pick bolt pattern. If I'm going to do random, I pick random. But you see you get the import from DXF button. So just to show you how they come in, I can click over import from DXF. Again, pick the drawing file I'm working from. And now as I select elements, it's now going to just highlight a hole. So when it comes to actually the drill, they're really easy, much easier. The limitation here certainly is I have to have a circle representing my drill hole. If there was just a point or a hash mark there, um, then it's not going to auto find it because it's assuming that if you want to drill a hole, you're going to drill a hole at a circle. So maybe this this is my first hole. It will assume or, or anticipate your first move, but you're not limited to it. Here I could jump over to that one. I don't want to do that. Let me do that again. I'm doing too many clicks here. Okay, so we're going to that hole to this hole, maybe to that hole. You know, you pick the holes that you want to start to drill. Once you get all the holes picked, you click accept drill points. And that's going to dump those coordinates right into the position screen. Now it's just a matter of saving it. In our case, we want to do a bolt hole pattern. So I'm going to go back to positions. If I was just doing a partial bolt hole, I would pick the partial. Here I can see I can get to the import from DXF. If I'm doing a full, I might as well pick full. Import from DXF. Open up the DXF file. And same scenario. So in this case, I need to pick one of the holes on the bolt hole pattern. And then it allows me to pick the direction. And I could actually even not only pick all the holes. So I want to get it so everything is being picked in one shot. You click on it twice, and now it's going to show you the pattern. So you just want to make sure you got all the holes in the pattern. If you got everything that you wanted, and this was direction, and you liked it, you hit accept. If you want to redo it like I just had to do before, just hit cancel, and then you can just reopen it up. So accept my drilling points. Transfer them in. Now it puts them in. So here you can see I had some kind of offset starting position because I picked a point that was certainly not at 090, 180, or 270. 
Um, I can change my strategy, so I'm not limited to shortest path. Um, I still control that at all at the cycle level. It's really just filling out where the zero is, um, you know, what's the number of holes, what's the radius, that kind of stuff. So now I got my drilled holes in my part program. We simulate it up. And it rolls around. There's your random locations. So it gives you quite a bit of control. Um, you know, I, I, do, I do like the way it, it functions. You know, some of the things may seem a little less intuitive when you're first getting used to it, only because we needed to design it to support both a mouse and not a mouse. So there's certain things that you, you see as you click around, you're like, gee, I wonder why if I click that twice, it moves the cursor. Just keep that in mind. The intention here was, you know, we make an open architecture control. The system's getting applied to all kinds of different machine tools. So with that being said, I don't know if the thing's going to have a mouse, a touch screen, nothing at all. It's really up to the OEM. So we, we kind of have to lay it out. But, but outside of that, it does give you quite a bit of freedom and flexibility. Okay. So the only other thing I wanted to show you real quick is just from the G-code side of the world. Because, you know, not everybody has shop mill or shop turn for that matter. Um, it is an option. Well, builders include it. Or maybe some guys, they're more CAD CAM based. Uh, but they do want to have the ability of doing some stuff at the control from G-Code or maybe intermix some features they would do at the control as well as from a CAD CAM system. So the function fully supports both milling and drilling um, in G-Code as well. Now, the layout's going to look a little different, but really this is just if you're familiar with how do you do the uh, contour milling functionality in G-Code as opposed to shop mill. So it's no different from the DXF file import, really just the mechanics of the difference of G-code as opposed to conversational. So here we're just going to pick a, a little parameter, grab the entities, and you get to see how it gets inserted into the part program. Um, then we'll just simulate it again, and you'll see the, the basic program, and it'll give us an output tool path. So just so you can kind of see the, the basic steps. I think once you see that, you can kind of get an idea of how you would apply it if you were doing all your programming. So everything we did before, regular pockets, islands, that's all supported in G-Code. So here I'm going to fire up a G-Code program. We're going to give it some name. I'll call mine sample three. Now, G-Code, just like it always would be, you'd have to fill out your safety line. So I'm going to give it G17 tool plane, absolute, inch, you know, work coordinate, um, maybe I want to give it my blank. So if you guys aren't familiar with um, program guide as opposed to shop mill, I've done a lot of webinars on the topic. Check out some of the webinars. Certainly we'll show you all the, uh, the nuances of how to write programs in our program guide as well as you would do in shop mill. Uh, I want to grab a tool. So in my case, maybe I'll use this half inch cutter right here. So we'll put our tool change in. Maybe we'll fire up our spindle, want to give it some feed strategy, right? So we're going to run this thing at a blaring 100 inches per minute. So we, we set it up however we would set it up. Now, this is the difference when you get the program guide as opposed to conversational. It's really where you position the contour. And the contours, you have a lot more freedom in program guide, really. So the contours can be all kinds of different places. The contour can be in the part program, which is what we're going to show you but it can be in a sub-program. It can be pointed to from labels or a name. So you can get to see kind of that functionality just associated with the DXF converter. So uh, give yourself an end of program, because if I'm doing just standard contours inside of the, uh, you know, a singular program, I want to position them below my M30. So just get your cursor down somewhere below an M30 statement. And now I can go over to contour mill, I can go to contour just like we did before. And there's one extra button here. This is the difference. And we'll show you that in a second when we go to use the contour. But I'm going to go new contour. I'm going to go import the app. So we try to keep things as, as similar between the two interfaces as we possibly can. So I'm going to call this my profile. Select OK. Browse to our drawing. And then you're going to pick the elements just like you did before. So let's go select some elements. I'm going to use this perimeter, and we'll start with that one. That's fine. 
and maybe we'll just turn on automatic. Pick the next one. It chained everything automatically. Back up. Hit accept. I'm always in the habit of taking automatic back off because sometimes I don't want to have it on. So, but you can leave that on if you use it all the time. Accept your contour, and now you're going to see really the fundamental difference between conversational and program guide, and that's what the contour looks like in G-Code. So the way it works is all this stuff down in gray, this is the output contour shape. So it's sitting between a label called profile. That was the name I used. Now at any point, as long as my cursor is anywhere in the middle of this, or the first line, if I right arrow over, I can open it up, I can edit it. So I can do all the same stuff, but this is really just the difference of what contours look like in G-Code as opposed to conversational. Now, you can you can start to you know build different kinds of contours. Let's say I wanted to do something a little more advanced. Maybe I want to machine up and leave this standing as a boss mill. Well, I can come down. I'm not limited to one contour. I would normally put my cursor just somewhere below the next one. This order of operations doesn't make any difference at this point. It's just when I go to use them. So let's say I was going to do a spigot cycle. I could do a new contour from DXF. I'm going to call this my stock because that would represent the stock for the spigot. Go pick some entities. So now I'm going to pick the box around the outside. All right. I would just, I'll just click the four lines, accept it, accept it again. Now I have two contours sitting down, one called stock, one called profile at the very bottom. So when it's time to use them in G-code, you do, what you do is you use this call contour function. And the call contour would follow the, the same strategy that I would have used um, when I was building it in ShopMill. So I want to call the stock first, or the outside bigger one first, and then I want to immediately call the next one, which is going to be my um, profile. You do want to make sure you get the name right here because it's looking for it. And then it's just a matter of giving it a cycle. So here we're going to use a spigot cycle, let's say. So we fill out the cycle, some retracts, some speeds and feeds. These numbers look okay. Machining a half inch down. So now we go to simulate, and those two call contour statements, that's what says, okay, jump down, find this contour that I'm going to use to represent what the stock is. So now it's giving me a nice optimized tool path around it. And voila. Certainly if there was more clearing, it would have just kept moving, a, moving on in. Okay. So with that being said, that is the bulk of the material. Material I wanted to go through with everybody. So what I'd like to do is certainly open up the floor to any questions you may have. Um, there's a Q&A panel there for you. So uh, feel free to type them in. We have a couple questions that came in already. So let me take a look at them and we can kind of go through them a little bit. Okay, so I have a question from Jerry. Um, He's asking if we've benchmarked it against the Herco DXF reader. Um, any selling advantages with the Siemens DXF programming? Unfortunately, I have not had a chance to be in front of the Herco DXF reader, so I don't know much about it. Um, but if there's any of my colleagues here that are familiar with how Herco's doing it, and they'd like to give us some, uh, some tips or some constructive criticism as far as you know, how we align with them, I'd be great to hear about it. Okay, so we got a um, question. Is the feature to use a DXF file new? What other file types are accepted? So it does only support DXF files. Um, we don't have it have the ability of bringing DWG or uh, Parasolid or any other type of features. Um, and primarily because it is just a 2D drawing uh, support function. When you get to DWG and some of the other file formats, um, they can support 3D, although they could be just 2D. Um, but we don't we don't know that per se. So it is just supporting DXF. Now, with that being said, 
we support a lot of newer file formats at the control. Um, so if you want to just open it from a viewer standpoint, you can bring PDF files to it. You can bring uh, JPEG files, GIF files. So there's all different kinds of file formats you can bring in. So if you're going moving down that the digitalization theme and you want to have a lot of electronic op sheets and setup sheets and whatnot at the control, you can have them there. They can be saved in memory. You just can't drive the DXF tool from them. That does require just a DXF file. Okay, let's see what else we have. Um, here's a good question. I think I did answer this briefly, but we'll, we'll say it again. Uh, can I plug a mouse into my machine? Um, so certainly there's a lot of different configurations of our control. I can't guarantee this, but typically I would say yes. Um, generally the USB support will immediately support a keyboard, um, a mouse, certainly some other peripherals. So if you have it on your control and you want to try it, go right ahead. I would say the likelihood is if you have a machine with 4.7 software, then um, certainly you're most likely going to have full mouse support, um, unless for some reason the OEM did something custom. Um, oh, here, here's a good question. How can I check my version? Here we've been talking about 4.7 being required. Uh, would be nice to, to know how to check that. So on the control, it's actually pretty straightforward. If you want to see whatever version of software you're running, just hit your alarm button. And if you can't find the alarm hard key, hit menu select and diagnostics. It's going to go to the exact same place. But you're going to get a versions key in the lower right hand corner. So click on the version button and it's going to take a few seconds to read. And when it pops up, it's going to show us the version of software that the machine is physically running. Um, so in our case, I look at the base software and I see version 4.7.03.1. So these are our service packs and hotfixes. The big thing we need to know is what is this base software? So it's 4.7. So once you know that, we know that if you don't have the feature, we can certainly add it. And adding it's pretty painless. Um, it's really a matter of, of going over to our license manager. And you would have to get issued a new license key. Once you get the new license key, then if you look at your options, you'll find that when you find the DXF converter, and I'm just going to do a quick search for DXF. Once you have the license, you have a little bit of checkbox in the gray. Now, it's, you still have to come in and check the white one, the set, that turns it on. Once you turn it on, then you can use it. Now, in, in the 4.7 software, we have a couple of what we call temporary licenses that you can turn on. So if this is something you want to play with, um, and you don't want to immediately jump to buying it, you can turn on this function and use it for a set amount of time. Um, the amount of time does vary based on if it's an 828 or an 840 control, but we're going to give you uh, 100 hours or a few hundred hours to play with it. Um, that allows you to actually turn on any of the options within the control. So you do have to enable the, um, the uh, temporary license, as we call them. Okay, so let's see what other questions we have. Um, do do. Ah, so uh, here we go. So Steve's asking, other than the ability of bringing the DXF file right into the control, how does the new version differ from the previous version? You know, there were a ton of features we brought into Core 7. Uh, so many so, I actually did a webinar on it um, maybe three, four months ago. Um, so I, I would say if you want to really dig into all the cool features within 4.7, check out that webinar. Um, but some of, the, some of the real high level stuff, one of the things we did that I was pretty excited about, we added a lot of functionality to our drilling cycles. So the drilling cycles, especially the deep hole drilling, we have different strategies here. So I can support deep hole drilling with pilot holes. You know, a challenge with deep hole drilling is you get this giant drill, right? It's drilling 20 times D, 30 times D. You can't run that at full RPM you're going to drill a hole at because it'll bend. So what you do is you either have it rotating extremely slow or maybe in a stop state. You insert it into a pre-pilot hole and then you fire up the spindle and drill a hole. Well, no machine can cycles anticipated this. So everybody's had to do this long hand all this time. Well, we have cycles now that fully support that functionality. So those are certainly a, a couple real high level cycles, especially for those of us that get into advanced drilling um, that uh, um, that you can start to look at. Uh, but outside of that, there's, I think they, 
I think we, we said that there's over 100 new features in 4.7. So check out that webinar. There's a ton of stuff I highlighted in it. Um, there was a question from Dan. How much does the import DXF function cost? You know, it's a good question. I, I haven't actually checked myself. Um, I would not be surprised if it's certainly less than $1,000, probably in the you know five or $600 range. But by all means, don't quote me on that. Um, if you're interested in it and we want to get a, a quote, we can certainly either go to the OEM or you can talk directly to us and we can check it out. But to be honest with you, I just haven't had a chance. I just know from past experience, we don't generally get charge, try to charge a lot for these options by any means. Okay, um, what else do we have? Uh, it looks like I caught them all. If I missed anything, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Again, let me put my, my contact information up here. Um, I certainly appreciate everybody uh, jumping in, especially with it the day before the holiday here. We got Labor Day weekend coming up. So I, I want everybody to have a great Labor Day weekend. Uh, enjoy. Don't think about work, just enjoy the family and friends, and I look forward to seeing everybody uh, the next, for the next webinar. All right, thanks guys.